You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go! Welcome back to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode it comes from Nobel Prize recipient Rita Levy Montalcini and says, If I die tomorrow or in a year, it is the same. It is the message you leave behind you that counts. If you want to know how to improve your brain performance, this is the episode for you. Our guest today is acclaimed neurologist Daniel Gallucci. Daniel is a trained functional neurologist, osteopath, and brain researcher. His clinical experience ranges from elite athletes like Olympians, national hockey players, and baseball star Alex Rodriguez to those with neurodegenerative disease and virtually everyone in between. Daniel is co-founder of Neurozine, a mental health wellness tech company known for its app that offers exercises and a personalized approach to not only sharpen cognitive skills and prevent diseases like Alzheimer's, but to also support mental health. In 2009, a personal brain cancer diagnosis further fueled Daniel's obsession with peeking behind the curtain and better understanding how the brain functions in both sickness and health. In this episode, we're going to talk about the simple research-based method to achieve achieving goals, daily activities to optimize your mental health, how Daniel helps some of the most elite performers on the planet, and the cutting edge work he's doing to improve mental health and treat diseases like Alzheimer's forever. Before we begin, remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with Daniel Gallucci. Dan, great to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on the Win the Day show. I am so excited to be here, James. I think it's going to be fun. Yeah, well, you have done so much amazing work, and I love all the things that you're doing now on the cutting edge of technology, so I'm super excited for all the things we're going to talk about today. To kick things off, I was hoping you could take us back to 2009 when you were diagnosed with brain cancer. Can you take us into that moment when you received the news and how that impacted your life at the time? Yeah, for sure. We can we can just get straight in there. So I think yeah, it was interesting. I, I'd come off of playing soccer at a fairly high level. I had been going to school. I had done a bunch of stuff. I was already involved in a functional neurology, clinical neurosciences program. So sometimes it seems romantic to think that, oh, well, this brain cancer then led to this journey of, of understanding the brain. And while I would say it undoubtedly furthered my obsession to all things brain, I was I was pretty, pretty obsessed by that moment in time. So it actually put it in a very interesting context where I was getting ready for a mixed martial arts competition. I was doing a lot of training in addition to the work and stuff that studying and work that I was doing. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, it didn't take a neuroscientist or a functional neurologist to figure out that I had been, you know, like a little takedown, you know, a little take a guy down, two legs, get taken down a bit. We were training at a friend's place, Claude Patrick, who went on to have a great UFC career. And then long story short, uh, suffered a, a seizure and came back and was like, ooh, that's bizarre. Like that, <laughs> I don't know why that's happening. I was like, oh, maybe just stress, lack of sleep, was changing diet, you know, a host of things. And then I went back to, I was very lucky at the time I was working at one of the higher end sports medicine clinics, probably in all of the world run by a Dr. Anthony Gallia. And he's like, you know, we should just get you. And I understand how lucky I was being up in Canada, even though we've got this amazing universal healthcare system, you sometimes wait extensively for stuff like imaging and things along those lines. So I was uh, lucky enough to get a pretty quick MRI scan. And I'll never forget the moment of kind of walking back because I knew these people. And I remember the, the, the radiologist, the technician, it was basically just the technician that was on staff. It was close to Christmas, almost exactly, yeah, 12 years ago now to the day. You know, again, being somewhat versed on the brain side, I peeked my little head in and was like, oh, what's that? Who's is that? Who's scan is that? And then the guy just, I'll never forget it. Like, it still gives me kind of chills. The guy just looked at me. He was like, you got to call a doc now. And I was like, oh, that can't be good. So that just started a long sort of journey. They found these astrocytomas, which are like these tumors that belong to the astrocytes, which are this type of supporting cell. It went on a crazy sort of putting me on the opposite end of the, the table, so to speak, where I instantly then, you know, became a patient and, and, and all that meant. So it, it really, you know, at the time was uh, undoubtedly a kick in the nuts, but uh, in hindsight now is something that, 
you know, I think has just almost been somewhat of a blessing in terms of not only the understanding of what it what it's like to be a, a patient, but also more so even how do we come up to these conclusions in science? What does data mean? Like where do, where do, where does this stuff come from? How do we make these diagnoses and things along those lines? So it again, it just kind of also fostered a journey that uh, I'm I'm still on today. Yeah, I can imagine it will give you an enormous amount of empathy for what a lot of other people go through through firsthand. And aside from receiving that diagnosis, obviously a lot of the work you do now is based in mental health and peak performance. Is there a particularly dark day that stands out for you on the, the mental health journey aside from that diagnosis that you're open to sharing with us today? Sure. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting, James. And I, I, I would lie to you. I would be lying to you if I told you, you know, how miraculously I had done and my fortitude had brought me through to these points of self-discovery and things. But, you know, I think my path was was a little bit different and, and one on in some ways that continues very much today because of a different context, having children and things along these lines. But at the moment, yeah, I, I still, and I, I don't know why it's still just, it's ingrained somewhere in my underlying networks of cells here where, you know, I could almost not process being in that appointment with the doctor where they were going through what was, what was happening. And I'll never forget sort of just like the, the, the smell of the room, the grayness of the walls. And then I left and probably just walked for three or four hours. And this is now January in, in, in Toronto, Ontario. So cold. Yeah. Really just thinking that like, there was so much I still thought I wanted to do in, in life and so many things that, that I was just contemplating, like, again, knowing a little bit of statistics on the back end and some of this stuff, sometimes <laughs> knowledge could be more of a curse where, you know, I just really was faced with my own sort of mortality in a way that that was troubling. But I'll, I'll be totally honest with you. What was the worst part of it was for some reason, my, my brain was playing this evil, evil trick on me where I would go to sleep and then I would wake up the next morning and for the first 20, 30 seconds, I just had, I just felt like I was just normal. And then I would be hit with this wave of like reality. And, you know, that, that probably stayed with me every day for maybe over a year. So it would almost be like being re-diagnosed over, it was Groundhog Day, it was being re-diagnosed over and over again. I could not, I tried things to, before I went to bed, you know, I was terrified to go to sleep because of then how I was going to wake up with this, with this reality the next day. And I couldn't, I couldn't fathom understanding why is it that this is, this is happening. And I've spoken to other people about it. It was just a, you know, weird sort of way that on some level, maybe my nervous system was trying to protect itself yet also then hitting me with this cruel reality on a daily basis. But that by far, by far was the sort of worst part of that, uh, the entire, that entire sort of journey. Yeah, it gives me chills you actually talking about that because a lot of people might think there are these people who have been able to overcome a lot of these really significant adversities through not necessarily a click of the fingers, but a lot smoother than a lot of other people. Yet a lot of the interviews I do there often seems to be those moments. There were, one that really stands out for me was Janine Shepard, who was hit by a truck and a whole horrific host of injuries where she had that moment where she basically just clasped her hands together and looked up at the sky and said, show me a way through or show me a way out. And uh, I really appreciate you sharing that today. I think it's important for, for people, especially after, you know, going on two years now with COVID where a lot of people are struggling to find meaning and uh, have had a lot of those mental health struggles themselves. You know, I think that was, you know, the only, well, not the only, but one of the saving graces throughout it. And this goes back to even something that I learned from a coach. This is why I still almost, in a way, I like to almost view myself almost as a coach more than anything else. I was with the Canadian under twenties at the time. And this guy profoundly affected my life, Hannibal Najjar. And, and we, I had, we'd had some issues like with my father that really struggled with mental illness and a few suicide attempts and also trying to play high level athletics at the time and and as tough as it was he you know just was there almost as a support person for me that just and I'll never forget it he made it abundantly clear and something that stuck with me that I still think about literally every day which was like there's there's so much uncertainty in this world Danny but you have to focus on you have to focus on being clear so you you need clarity amongst that uncertainty and and Really, it, it focused, it enabled me to focus on what, okay, what can I be clear towards today? Okay, well, I can still move, I can still get up and walk, I can still do this, I can still go to work, I can still 
So regardless, there were so many factors that I would not be able to control. And I unfortunately like obsessed over, oh, okay, is it going to grow by two millimeters? Is it down? Is it like to the point that you just, it, 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 it becomes overwhelming. It was focusing on the things that I could just have a level of clarity towards and, and keeping that sort of perspective. And it's still now, because again, you still go for follow-up scans, you have children, you have wife, you know, you, these are things that in some way I, I would say are always sort of present and, and there, although it's a, you know, hopefully it just stays as this is behind the scenes operating system, but focusing on those things that I could sort of control, or I did have better sorts of abilities to, to sort of create an environment around myself that could maybe sort of cater to where I wanted from where I was to where I needed to go became very important steps, I think, in, in the overall process. Yeah, you're spot on about those things about um, what's in your control versus out of it. Like, I don't think I've actually ever shared this publicly before. Um, about five or six years ago, I was diagnosed with a, I just went for a, a routine, it wasn't routine, I'd hurt my back, you know, um, being a bit too aggressive in the in the gym at the time. And I got a call from the radiologist who was a very good friend. And he said, look, I've got some news for you. And it was a, a schwannoma that they had picked up. Oh. You would probably know a lot more about this than I would, but it mm-hmm. was in the, um, in the nerve layer there, which apparently is a very difficult position for it to be in and the way that that would eventually manifest is that I would eventually lose feeling down like my right foot and all of those different things. And as someone who's very active and now uh, I have a, um, you know, a a two-year-old daughter and another one on the way, and uh, I have to go back for these scans. It was every six months for a while, then it was every year. And now it's back again every six months. And it's after that MRI, you just, you're waiting for the, the results. And when the doctor's like, have you, you know, are you noticing any feeling that you've lost in your, in your right foot or right side of your body or anything like that? And it's, it, it certainly makes you think, but I can't, I can't dwell on that. Like I'm in there and I'm, I'm intrigued, but the moment I leave, I just, I, I can't even think about it because I'm, I'm worried about what that would reduce my actions and mindset to if I was focusing on that, which is something I can't control. A hundred percent. And you know, the interesting thing is kind of bringing it back sort of full circle, I think. You know, there's been having been also being a clinician where there's a wonderful amount of people that can do exactly what you had done in those sorts of scenarios there. And, you know, what I'm super interested in and super focused on moving forward is what is it in, in James's underlying biology that enables him to do that? Or if you're on the flip side, not do that. And I think this kind of gets to that point where it's a, it's a bit of a weird thing because it can be a paradox and something that we've even internally struggled with, even with the, the company it, it, itself in terms of trying to understand how we're trying to create a messaging moving forward. It's like, I, I, in the world of, you know, high level performance in the world of healthcare in the world of medicine, there are so many interesting things that we're being able to find. You can go do that scan on the schwannoma. I can go do this thing on the, on the MRI and stuff that I have a lot of now experience with as a, as a professional as well. Yet on the flip side, there's the total opposite. It's the behavioral focus. So it's about, okay, well, what do we do here? The world of healthcare does this, the world of mental wellness does this, the world of you know, and there was this chiasm that was continuing to emerge, uh, emerge that I was seeing in clinic, which was like, oh, there's all this information over here, but now there's all this behavioral stuff over here. And how do you kind of pull it together in a way that kind of makes sense for people and, and you can act on for, for people? Because I think on the one, nobody cares about a science project and the stuff that's happening over here. Yet on the flip side, on the purely behavioral side, this is what I was seeing over and over and over again then getting into the roles as a clinician and as a researcher, if people did not have the underlying fundamental tools in their brain to do what we were asking them to do, what we were pleading for them to do, what we wanted them to do, family members wanted them to do, I just couldn't do it. So if I was like, okay, James was able to make this amazing sort of transition and he's been able to do these amazing things in his life. And I go and put James in the scanner and we do this fancy MRI, functional MRI and overlap that with DTI. So we can see function of the brain. We can see every neuron and how it's wired of the brain. And I can put a mask on James's face and hit him with levels of carbon dioxide and see how does his brain adapt in real time as I hit him with this, this stimuli. The reality of it is in so many cases, 
that underlying biology, and we can discuss why, is not sufficient to enable sort of the changes that we're willing to take place. So on that behavioral side, well, just do more of this, just do more of this, this maximizing sense of control. And it's like, yes, well, what about if that child that's in there has an amygdala that's twice the size that it should be because he grew up in an adverse situation and his mother was suffering from this. And, you know, there's, there's so many things that need to be contextualized in the aspects of behavior. And I think that we need to do a better job of pulling biology along with it to say, okay, well, within the context of what's happening in the biology of this person right now, how do we address these things moving forward? What is it that we need to be able to do moving forward? We'll be back with the show shortly. If you're a business owner and have a podcast of your own, we've got a free gift just for you. It's called the Recurring Results Roadmap, and we've created it to give you a detailed blueprint to scaling your business using your podcast. So if you're overwhelmed with a never-ending to-do list, struggling to work on the business instead of in it, or simply want the formula to massive business growth, this is for you. Click the link in the show notes and download a free copy of the Recurring Results Roadmap. It will show you exactly how you can use a podcast to maximize your business revenue. All right, let's get back into the fun. It's so good. And the work that you're doing now with, with Neurozine, I'd love to talk about you know, the why of all these different things and the way that it was described to me once with things like trauma that people go through at a childhood level. Um, it's very much like pages of a book when you're trying to work with someone, you're almost trying mm-hmm. to add in a new page of, of good to remove some of the, the pages of trauma there. So it's a long process rather than, again, clicking your fingers. And I know um, with your app and the work that you're doing, you've got so many activities and exercises that help people with that. Do you want to give us a broader overview of what you do with Neurozine? and what the, the problem that you wanted to solve is and, and why you felt like it fell on your shoulders to do it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, James, because I, I think on, on one level, it goes back to that sort of clinical sort of chiasm that was emerging, which was like, oh, wow. I'm, and again, realized I'm one of the luckiest people on the planet because of some of the environments that I've been in. And I think that counts for a ton in terms of understanding that, okay, uh, you're running this clinic, you're doing this high level neuroscience and performance and all this stuff. And it's, it's, it's great. And then once you start layering in the research side and it's like, Oh, okay, let's take, and again, lucky just through some of our network, we can bring high level professional athletes in, but we could also bring people. There were people coming right out of stroke surgeries. There were people that were having tumor repairs. There were children with developmental issues. So this, diaspora of people that you could look at in the scanner. And really it's so funny because even in my mind where I, in, in, in theory, I knew I, I learned, I'd been trained to say, Oh, well, you know, it's the brain that's going to generate mind and it's the neurons and it's how they work and it's how they fire and not fire and all this sort of stuff. Even myself, I had been kind of failing on some level because then I would just try and will certain things to happen or will patients to do things in certain ways and try and, very militaristic about my approach in some ways. And sometimes that would work, but the reality of it is I'll, I'll never forget it. There was a young, you know, 15 year old um, that had suffered not, and not recently had suffered from, which we only found out later, he was having typical sorts of learning issues, anxiety issues. His parents were worried about depression. He was a family friend. And we, we went and, you know, scan this, 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 this kid. And, you know, once you started then digging into the history, you saw like not only were there adverse situations in that child, sort of the way they had grown up, there was a multitude of a history of traumatic brain injury. And so there was all this stuff in there that was like, wow, you know, we could tell this kid till the cows come home to meditate and be socially better at school and do all these things. It does not have the tools at this moment to do it. So how do we just go back to those fundamentals? How do we go and understand that, you know what, the brain is this amazing, self-organizing, dynamic, interconnected organ. And yet what we're doing is we're just kind of treating it from a behavioral perspective, not so much a biological one. And again, I'm not against the behavioral side. I think there's some phenomenal people that are working on that behavioral side. But my choice was to say I'm taking a very mechanistic, almost very fundamental, sometimes we'll call it radically fundamental approach to saying, how do we give these people the tools that they need to be able to be successful from wherever they are to wherever they need to go. So, 
yeah, I think a lot of that was from the clinical side into then the, the sort of really research-based side. And then realized there's really, James, there's, there's a ton of low-hanging fruit there, especially because that underlying biological narrative isn't one that's focused on. You don't need to do a ton of things all at one moment in time, but just being able to provide direction and say, okay, well, this is, there may be an understanding as to why this is happening that could be based on biology. And let's put a plan forward together to be able to kind of address it. So that's kind of where Neurocene had emerged from, you know, funny enough, prior to the pandemic. And then because of the pandemic and things along those lines, people have been a lot more open to the idea of technology being this amazing little bridge um, into the world of healthcare. But it's still something that a lot of us really, uh, really struggle with, but something that we're working towards trying to address. Mm. Are we on the at the point now where we can reverse the onset of things like dementia and, and Alzheimer's? When you look at Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's is one form of a, of a dementia disorder, and you're looking at primarily this amyloid plaque, which then looks to be able to form into tau tangles. We have done, it's one of the greatest failures ever in the history of medicine, which is the therapeutic interventions to Alzheimer's disease, because they basically do not work. And for the foreseeable future, I'm not telling people not to buy stocks and companies that are making them, but for the foreseeable future, I do not see them working either. And it's primarily because we're still, and again, we can dig into that a little bit more, which then goes back to the essence of what we're trying to do and others are trying to do as well is that oftentimes people are still looking at Alzheimer's disease in a way of thinking that's almost 500 years old that goes back to the Christian conquests of like linear reductionism. So it's basically like, like I had just said, well, what's Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's is amyloid beta, it's tau tangles. Okay, well then in my very linear reductionist Western you know, medical way, let's look at these things and let's be able to develop some drugs against them. But again, when we look at it, that's just, you know, we can, it's, it's actually not that difficult to be able to dig down. It's not, be able, it's not hard to swim with the tide and, and be able to become down and reduced down to the tiniest little level. And we need to do it. Like, undoubtedly, it's not that we don't need to do it. The problem is, and I'm sure you could appreciate because I know you, you surf and you do things like this. It's like nature and biology and everything, let's just, just even say your brain is so massively chaotic and dynamic that that linear form of reductionism is in no way gonna give you a representation of what's actually happening at the brain. So by the time you see that amyloid beta, by the time you see that tau tangle that then develops after, there is so much disease process that's already taken place. So again, there's companies that will continue to do that and we'll see what happens there our focus as well as many others and people that are in this space is about understanding like, how do you not get that pathology there to begin with? Are there things that we can do to not have that initial conversion am over to amyloid beta? And again, what you're starting to see is that these are now what you used to think of as a 10 year progressive disease or a 15 year progressive disease. These are 20, 30, 40 year progressive diseases. So on some level, it's why I think for us, I'm so passionate about working also with youth is because it's easy now to be able to say, oh, okay, well, look, let's go back 20 years. And this is all the stuff that's gone all shitty for why people are really suffering now. And it's like, okay, understood. So this is why what we need to do is start fixing this now for the next two decades. So yeah, I think there's some very interesting things out there in the world of prevention and trying to stop the disease process at the very beginnings, but it's still very early days. And then on the opposite side, yeah, that's, it's still a massive failure. Mm, yeah. Uh, you do a lot of work on the personalized side for the individual, which is great. And also harnessing the power of the body and the brain, which is interesting now because Dr. Nicole Birkins, the world's leading holistic child psychologist shared a lot of that stuff too, rather than mm. trying to break it down. There's uh, obviously a lot of synergies between what goes on in the body, the brain, gut health, and all of those different things. 
for someone who wants to improve their cognitive abilities each day, maybe they're just a, a regular business person or an athlete who wants to get to that next level. Uh, maybe there's someone who's overcoming trauma or, or maybe there's someone who wants to prolong or re remove the probability of the onset of things like Alzheimer's and, and dementia. Uh, what type of things can they be doing on a daily basis or is it very much dependent on what their, um, their situation and, and their goals? On one level, you're right. And I think it's, it's fascinating because again, we have a lot of tools at our disposal. There's a lot of stuff out there that you can see in the world of like brain training and this and that, and all these sorts of like cognitive devices and stuff like that out there. And while I think if you, anybody digs into any of the research, you'll see that, you know, a lot of those results are, are, are not really very looking very promising at this moment in time. And I think it goes back to those very same basics. It's, it's like, we, we have a real problem still in modern neuroscience, which is like you have a frame of thinking. It's almost like, I think Steven Pinker calls it the tabula rasa, where the brain is this sort of blank slate. And then what we need to do is we need to throw stuff on top of this blank slate. So James wants to perform better. He wants to think better. He wants to cognitively be more engaged. So we're going to throw stuff on top of James's brain to enable him to be able to, to do so. The problem with that is that you know, biology has been solving complex problems way, way, way before brains ever existed. We can go back 2 billion years to when cells were first coming together in the dawn of sort of aerobic respiration, which was this little bacterial cell coming into an archaeal cell. And now all of a sudden we have breathing. So now all of a sudden we have respiration via this mitochondria. And it's like, wow, this respiratory mechanism is enabling the cell to now survive and proliferate. And then we take obviously many steps of evolution through the process, yet we now want to think of this only top down, let's do this with the brain. And to be honest, it, it just doesn't work that way. So I, I feel like what we need to do is understand that the brain is this amazing, again, self-organized entity that's dynamic and interconnected. And almost as you said there, what we need to do is often just kind of step out of the way. Let's remove the things that could be hindering us from having that level of cognition or that level of performance that we need. And I can promise you any success that I've had in the level of professional sport, lucky enough to have been to the Olympic games, the, the world series, the NHL playoffs. It's not about what can I add in for these people? It's about what can I remove so they can just be as great as they inherently are. And it's no different for somebody coming off of a surgical repair somebody that's getting ready for the World Series. And so for me, it goes back to basic fundamentals. What are the things that we can do to mechanically and fundamentally stimulate the brain to do these amazing things? So one would be, okay, things like the, in the context of where we're living right now in the world of COVID and stress, it's like if we can model stress on an individual person by person basis, that level of personalization and say, okay, nobody cares, nobody needs, no, I shouldn't say nobody cares, but you know, when you go to nice parties and conferences, you know, and people care, but you know, when you speak to actual patients or actual users, do they care about glucocorticoid releases and cortisol time scales and things like that? No, they just need to know what are you going to do for me? What are you going to, you know, so this whole idea of what is stress for you becomes ultimately important. And this is something that we can now model using technology in, in real time and be able to understand, okay, well, how do we put people in a zone? The great, and unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, Bruce McEwen, this neuroendocrinologist, inverted U stress curve, which I use all the time. It's like, no stress is no good. So you're understressed. Then you have this, what you call allostatic overload. You have too much stress. That's no good either. There's a zone in the middle that's kind of like caution. You could go one way or another. And then there's a nice little like flow zone, a nice little sweet spot where it's like, oh, you have all the nice, amazing, wonderful things that the stress system is designed for, which is primarily acute in nature. And so you get the learning, the adaptation. And so how do we then just manage these sorts of variables around to be able to put people in that zone where they can inherently be productive? So then it goes to, are they moving enough? Are they sleeping well enough? What is their nutrition like? Like, what is their social environment? Like, again, back to the research of like McEwen and stuff, you can tell people to do all the Sudoku. I, again, no problem with it. Go on Lumosity, do all the brain games and things along those lines. If that person is in an environment where their basic needs 
are being challenged and they are maybe in, in a, a weird sort of relationship where there's th- like, there are so many things, again, because biology is so dynamic that are not going to enable them to perform. So for us, oftentimes it's like, how do we start by stripping some of the stuff away that could be impeding on somebody from getting where they are to where they, from where they are to where they want to go. And then very basics. How are you moving? Because you know, if movement again, exercise, and we're going to speak maybe, let's be specifically aerobic exercise, aerobic exercise. Let's say you're going out one intensity at a pace that you can keep a conversation where you're using oxygen primarily as a fuel source and not too much lactate. You can actually make new neurons there. So it's like, you can actually be building new neurons and this can be in your seventh, eighth decade of life. You can be building new neurons that can be useful in these areas that you need to be able to mitigate stress. So I would say if we had to choose, okay, are you going to choose, you can just tell somebody to exercise versus go on this cognitive brain training app? 100% because the brain doesn't work top down. It works inside out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's a host and we can go through more, but there's a host of things like that, but it's, it's an approach that's based pretty fundamental, but it's about restoring those basic things that have enabled us to evolve to get to where we are right now. Those people who are the absolute uh, best performers, whether they're athletes or top surgeons or special forces, is there anything they do different consciously in terms of being able to harness that peak performance over time? I think they, you know, that's, it's, it's, that's another sort of, obsession of mine is looking at it in, in, in that sort of way. And there, yeah, I, I would say that there are a few things that they do amazingly well. And one would be able to understand the context of behavior. And again, I think it seems like, oh yeah, well, that's, that's kind of obvious, but I think the reality of it is it's so difficult in the moment to really appreciate that. And again, I think that so much emphasis is put on behavior and it's so contextual that people need to be able to understand. And these high level performers are able to sort of understand the context of behavior at that moment in time. So saying, listen, it's totally normal for me to be feeling this way as I'm going to go up to bat with 60,000 people here. And I've just gone over, I've gone over eight, (laughs) but I can separate that. And I can then still put the mental process in place to be able to say, what are the actions that I need to perform right now that, again, I have that clarity towards that's going to enable me to increase my chances of being successful. So we often, and we play around with it, but we almost play these little, it's almost like game theory. We play these little games back and forth because what we need to understand is that even this idea, again, it comes to this and again, I'm not trying to undermine it, but I think this sort of like Horatio Alger's method of we just all pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and rah, 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 and I'm maximizing the sense of control. That actually, I've never actually seen that work at the highest level. What I've seen is sort of backing down, not so much hubris, an appreciation for where I am in relation to my environment at this moment in time understanding that what my mind may be thinking could be combined of so many different minds that have led me to this moment in time. And that with all that stuff, I'm still going to be able to put the pieces in place to be able to focus on certain action items. What are the things that I need to focus on and how do I move forward rather than being again, so reactionary to, Ooh, the pressure, Ooh, this, Ooh, the, like, yeah, that, that's something that at least in my experience has, has been something that's very interesting. And then, Lucky enough, James, some of these people um, we've been able to then put, and I can't say who on, on this side, but some of these people we've also been able to put into the brain scan. So then what does it look like under the hood? And then what I would say, if it was like separating the behavioral side, and again, I'm more biological in nature and, and trying to say, what does the brain look like? It is, a, it is such a, it almost still gives me goosebumps. It is such a wonderful level of efficiency that it's insane. So one example I would give is, okay, you could take one of the best NHL hockey players on the planet and you could take another pretty good NHL hockey player that's still making three or $4 million a year. And when they are performing certain tasks in the, you ask them to visualize certain things in terms of how they do certain things on the ice and you watch this light up in real time, the guy that is making $12 million a year, you know, 
has this amazing ability to almost shut off. It's the ability to inhibit. Because again, the brain is primarily, again, which I think some people, a narrative that's just not spoken enough about, it's this amazing compressive tool. You know, it's got 85 billion neurons and it does what it does, generating 20 watts of electricity. When you have IBM Watson doing the same thing, like IBM Watson's gonna go beat James in a game of Jeopardy, it takes 85,000 watts. Like you're powering a small city to be able to have that level of computation. So how efficient is this person's brain? And then go to the flip side, that, that they've done this with orthopedic surgeons and brain surgeons, the same thing exists. So with that high level surgeon versus a guy that's on surgical residency, that, that tenured, that you know, well-revered surgeon can almost act with a certain level of automaticity where his brain is just so efficient. Whereas the young guy or girl is like, oh, am I doing this right? Should I cut this? Or, you know? So you know, at, at the brain level, there's almost this beautiful level of efficiency, which then goes back to that sort of, sort of self-organizing, interconnected, dynamic sort of flow that's just so wonderful to see when you see it. What is the role of repetition in getting out of your comfort zone gradually for something like that? You know, I think about, yeah, whether it's athletes like the NHL player you mentioned, who's at the best of their, their game or someone like a, a, you know, a Conor McGregor who seems to thrive off that energy when he's at the Wayne in front of 50,000 people, or even people who are, who are speaking on stage or, you know, that repetition of, of just getting those reps in, in an uncomfortable environment. Is that, does that build that or is it separate to what you're talking about? I think I'm going to say both, which is an annoying answer, and I apologize. <laughs> but on some level, it's necessary because there's no doubt. There is no doubt that repetition is needed to be able to, you know, again, a good old Canadian surgeon way back in the day uh, coined this term, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. So this idea of neuroplasticity, this idea of like being able to create these paths, you know, that trail in the sand that just gets solidified over and over the more you walk it. And unequivocally, that is true. What I would still say on the opposite side, when it comes to, let's say, aspects of behavior. So let's say we're trying to get somebody to do something new and we want somebody to do something new. And because it's new, it's just a behavior. But our goal is to turn that behavior into a habit. So it's now habitual that James is going to go and do his exercise every day. It's now habitual that James is going to balance his blood sugar and do these sorts of things every day. It is actually not repetition that leads to that habitualness. It's the emotional reward. So how do we reward James emotionally for being able to make these sorts of decisions? And how do we then continue that process? So it's like when, we, when it's about creating these, let's say, habits or these new habits, it's like, okay, what's the motivation? Okay, James really wants to do it. Okay, what's the ability? Okay, he's got the ability to do these sorts of things. He's not asking to be able to run a three-minute mile right now. Okay, so he's, he's got the ability to do these sorts of things. How do we then tie that into something that's existing? So when it's coming to like, okay, well, how do we build this performance module for moving forward? How do we, then we want to anchor it to things. So we want to say, okay, well, James is already, already brushing his teeth every day. So we're just going to say, James, after you brush your teeth, that's when you're going to go surf. Or that's when you're going to go, we're going to suggest. So we're going to anchor it to something that already exists to increase that odds. And then again, that important side is we're going to reward him after that. And again, it could be society rewarding James. This could be his family rewarding, friends, wife, spouse. Whatever it's going to be, usually those things that get rewarded are able to become a little bit more habitual in nature. And then on the flip side, you know, those things that get, and sometimes the word punished can be a little bit harsh, but we need to be able to almost create that negative association on the same side as well. You know, I started journaling. There's an app called the Day One Journaling app, and I use that every single morning. But when I started it, I wanted to do it. I said to my wife, I'm only going to do this if I commit to 100 days of consecutive journaling. And I do it with my morning coffee. And if there's one part of my day that I'm not missing, it's my morning coffee. As, as an yep. Australian, we, we love our coffee. And, uh, sure. and that's it. I haven't missed a single one. I've you know, now that's done about amazing. 150 of those consecutive. The power of anchoring that is... Wow, it's huge, isn't it, with, with not just goal setting, but goal achievement. And that's where I think, and again, that's what leads, and I think the anchoring also then leads to part of that sort of emotional reward that you get. Again, it's this amazing dynamic feedback, because I would also go to the opposite side. It's like, I can see a lot 
of people that have put in a ton of repetition, they don't necessarily get better. So do they not, there's something else in there that needs to be thrown on top of the rep, this Anders Ericsson, 10,000 hours and things like that. It's like, I, I get it, I understand it, but it's not necessarily true because you can also create a habit. I, again, I have the other ones in here now just because I trust them a little bit more for this moment, but it's like, I could easily go from Bluetooth to this, to that. I, I could change that habit in a day, no problem, because now I've got this emotional reward of being able to get up and move around. So I think a lot of that, research on how these things change and how do you create that? I think it's a little, it's a little overstated. And I often think it's just very basic in nature. It goes back to the basic biology of reward systems. And if you can reward that system, if you could reward that, then it often goes a, a good way in terms of being able to re-incentivize it and keep it going moving forward. Does that need to be an ex, uh, external reward or is there some way that you can reward yourself to, to build that feeling? I actually think it's both. I, I, I think that, you know, we, we talk about, you know, in the world of modern neuroscience and you think about these internal, the dopaminergic sort of reward system. It's like, okay, well now this person is, you know, doing this and this, and they are going to get this little internal hit of dopamine. And I think that's super valuable and understood. I think that also becomes potentially I don't mean all the time, but potentially that also becomes a bit of a dangerous proposition in terms of if you look at, at a dopamine sort of reward based curve, what you'll see is just like stress, it's biphasic. So what happens is, okay, well, I got that reward today and maybe I got that reward tomorrow, but now a few days later, I don't have that same level of reward. So I need a greater stimuli. I don't have that same level of reward. Now I need a greater stimuli. And again, that's okay, but we just need to understand that this is exactly how the system works when we're looking at things like behavior, because then what was a surprise yesterday is expected today, and then it's not enough tomorrow. Mm. And we need to understand that basic biology in terms of the context of how we behave. So again, I still look at it from those very fundamental sorts of basic principles, but I think it's super helpful because then it helps me dictate sort of the behavioral response. It helps me show that, okay, well, it's still this brain that's generating mind on, on that level there. Your app Neuro is making big waves. What, what's unique about it? And what are you hoping to do to disrupt the mental health industry? I, you know, thank you for saying that for one, I, I think, it's very early days at this moment in time. I think these, this initial version of the app is basically just a, it's just a test version really at this moment in time. I think you know early in the new year when we release our first sort of commercial version of the app, I think it'll be very, I'm hoping, <laughs> knock on wood, I'm, I'm hoping it'll be, you know, I, I'm hoping it'll be a point in the conversation which is like, listen, there's a group out here right now that's really trying to look at those fundamentals. That's really trying to back to stress. For example, stress is 600 million years old, maybe even older than that. So stress has been in existence way before humans were ever around, way before our brains were around. The thing is we're living in a society right now that's incompatible with that ancient system because it was meant for an acute sort of, Hey, I'm going to eat something or I'm going to be eaten or I'm been gorged by a lion and I better figure out how to get out of here pretty quick. The stress system was not made in a way to be able to think of like, mm, okay, well, should I go here for vacation? Well, my kids going to school. Did I do my taxes? So again, we are the only species that can bring that level of stress for purely psychological reasons, which again, that's amazing because it gives us the flexibility to plan to go to the mood and do all these things and create a podcast, which is also unique to us. But the context of that needs to be understood. So I think our goal is to say, listen, there's a lot of great mental and physical health apps and companies and stuff out there. What we want to do is put you at the center of your own healthcare journey. We want to be able to give you the tools to say that, hey, in very simple ways, we can democratize some of the basic things that everybody should have access to on the planet, which is why it's free that says, okay, listen, you need these things. Back to myself as a kid, it's like when my, unfortunately my father's going through mental health related issues and we're struggling financially and things like that. Even in a universal healthcare system, we only have access to certain resources. And it's like, hmm, 
everybody should have the basic fundamentals of, hey, listen, let's understand that things in development, that there are some things that are going to affect the neural architecture of your brain no matter what. And that's irreversible. But that doesn't mean it's not changeable. So what do we then do to give people the tools to be able to navigate that moving forward? Okay, yes, you may be in a shitty situation. It could be really shitty. But that doesn't, usually doesn't mean there's no option. Mm. And how do we take, again, where you're at and give you a very fundamental sort of way forward? And yes, maybe it just starts with movement. And, oh, oh, really? It starts with movement? And that's going to get me out of this sort of crisis right here? And it's like, not at that moment. But putting these things in place becomes self-affirming in nature. And these little micro actions lead to results later down the road. So again, it's no different than that guy showing up at the Super Bowl. He didn't all of a sudden make that Odell one-handed, wasn't in the Super Bowl, but make that one-handed catch. It's like, what are the things that went in place to put that person in that position? And the same thing here, put yourself in control give yourself the tools to be able to do a lot of these things. Yes, we could dig into nuance and you could do all this other stuff later, but those basic fundamentals, when, I, and I ask people, you go into clinics, you go into, and I had no idea I could grow new neurons here. I had no idea I could control this. I had no idea that using my eyes in certain ways could help balance out the way certain areas of my brain were functioning. And this is all thing that science knows, but what we need to be able to do, and I sometimes will say it, it's like, Neuroscene needs to begin where science ends, which is like science are these amazing little snapshots of, of a moment in time. But how do we build on those snapshots? Life is a movie in 8K. So how do you take those amazing little snapshots and put it together into something that's actually hopefully helpful for people moving forward? Mm. You're doing a lot of work now, obviously, the research side specifically, uh, doing a lot of work with AI, and you're very much on the cutting yeah. edge of that technology. What future innovations are you most excited about that are just around the corner? That's a good question. There's, there's, there's literally, there's too many jigs. You, you know, <laughs> coming at it from the, uh, and I kind of will go at it from both sides. One on the, on the clinical side is the best thing about this opportunity, I, I think, is, again, building on the healthcare system of old, which was just very crude and very, you know, it's just, you know, if you use Parkinson's disease, for example, it's like, okay, unfortunately, we all probably know somebody that's been afflicted and affected. It's like, okay, um, we're going to give this person L-dopa because it's the medication that they need. And then all of a sudden you give that medication and you don't see that person again for 60 days. But over those 60 days, you could be acquiring tons of data in terms of how that person's moving, how that person's not sleeping. And, and then when that person comes back 60 days later, your medical decision is based on, oh, what do they do again? Like, I'm gonna tap this little thing here. And so it's, again, it's just so basic and crude because we're just emitting all this information that we could particularly gather. So I think, the problem with that is like, oh, now you want to collect movement data on people and you want to collect behavioral stuff and you want stress scores and you want, I do, I want it all. I want all that data because I want to build terabytes. I want, I'm going to have terabytes of now information that I, I need to make decisions from. The problem with that, James, is that you now need the high level analysis to get rid of all the stuff that's garbage because mm -hmm. most of it's garbage. It's massively expensive and you really don't know what to do to act on it. So this is where we... We've now acquired this company called Netramark, this gentleman, Dr. Joe Giracci, who you should, again, speak to him on a separate thing. It's like, it's a mathematical genius, but also in the world of medicine and on oncology. And so he's got an amazing, and again, it, you, we can sometimes, as, you, as you'd know, you could broad sweep AI, machine learning, it's all just sounds like the same thing. The reality of it from a clinical perspective, you know, it's so hard to make sense of all this very sort of what you'd call heterogeneous or ugly, messy, noisy data. And they just have a system that is able to kind of look through problems at multiple levels of organization, which for me was like, ah, this is why I like these guys. This is what I need in these guys is that they're not just going to show me a variable, they're not just going to show me amyloid beta and model that, and then come back to me. And it's like, no, I want to look at all this ugly stuff. I want to see how you model that. I want to see how you cluster people in a certain way. I want to see how that, that works. And yeah, so I think that's hugely, it's the most exciting part for me is being able to understand disease on a person-to-person -person level is, is going to be magnificent because I think cancer 
is a disease that's on a person-to-person -person level. I think anything related to the brain is going to be on a, coming from the world of traumatic brain injury and working with concussions and all this sort of neuropathologic sort of these conditions. These are very different from a, on a person-to-person -person basis. So you almost need the medicine. You need the system in place. You need to build a map around these levels of disease that can happen on an individual basis as well. And I think that's part of the potential in the world of, of, of AI and machine learning. It's like the first time, and when you think about it, it's the first time in human history that we're really, you know, handing over our powers of decision-making to machines. And, mm -hmm. and I think that needs to be, because I think humans, you know, if I'm watching my, my, my Liverpool, I'm a football fan. If I'm watching my Liverpool and they go and get, pumped on the weekend, I'm going to say, yeah, but I'm a clinician. I'm going to show up Monday morning and I'm going to do a great job. But now we start to see that these things start to affect our performance. So again, as you would appreciate, and I've heard you speak about on the podcast before, so much of what's happening in our brain is subconscious. So we're processing all this subconscious stuff and there's bias and noise. So yeah, I think almost on some level, while there's no replacing humans, I think that, again, it's only natural that we've evolved to be able to build informational architectures from one generation to the next. And we need to leverage technology to be able to do it now. Oh yeah. The predictability that's going to be created from AI and all those different things is, is going to be huge. Uh, Dan, I feel like I could talk to you forever. We've got one more question before we move into the, the rocket sure. round on your best day. What's an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard to show yourself on your worst day. It's going to be, and you're going to be like, Oh, they call me Danny Downer on the team <laughs> and you'll see why. And, and again, I'll have to then explain it a little bit, but I, okay. I won't go as far as to say you don't matter that, I, but I will say it doesn't matter, but I'm basically referring to myself. You know, I, I think I've been, and I can blame, I can say, well, now I have every reason for it because I have brain cancer and I have this and I have this, but we can all say these things in, in different levels. I think when you look at the grand scheme of things and yes, of course, hopefully, my family loves me and all this sort of stuff. The grand scheme of what's happening in the world right now, what's happening in the universe right now, there's so many things that are just not as important as, as we would like to, to think that they are. And I, I'm the worst at it. I manifest these things on a, on a daily basis. So, you know, I, I think that would be one of those things in, the, in terms of just that, that little snippet of just recognizing the importance or not of certain things. Yeah, love it. Well, let's now move into the win the day rocket round. 10 questions for some fairly okay. quick answers. You up for this one, Dan? I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Let's do it. Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Okay. Almost, again, almost <laughs> on that same vein, you're going to be like, am I even posting this? Um, <laughs> I would say I, I love Robert Frost and I think some, the author, and I think something he said, which is change can happen, although it's somewhere between difficult and impossible, is, is just something that, yeah, it really hits home for me because it helps me manage expectations for people. I think people have often underappreciated sort of like how much effort goes into sometimes making change. And while we can say it can be easy, I, I like to almost plan it accordingly and say, listen, it can happen, but it's, it's going to take some work. Yeah, it sounds like it's got some roots in stoicism, that type of thing. So yeah, yeah totally yep. get it. Yeah. Uh, number two, morning coffee or evening wine? But I almost died. I'm, I'm gonna, I got to go both. I got to go both. I'm going to say both. But if you force me, I'm going to say, I'll say, I'll say morning coffee with a little splash of good olive oil in it. <laughs> oh, no, it's interesting. Too. Yeah, love it. Uh, number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? Get ready. Mm. Get ready. Number five, what book do you gift the most? I actually have two because I have a lot of science friends and they get one book and then I have just everybody else that gets another book. If I had to say one, I'll go behave, Robert Sapolsky. Yeah. Is that the science one? No, that's the actual, <laughs> that's the, he's a scientist, but no, that's the one that I give to, he just writes phenomenally for layman, for layman people, but sort of like the underarching biological aspects of our behavior, which is behave. I think the other one, I don't know, I'll, I'll send you after if you've seen any of the work of uh, Sam Bowles and Herbert Gintis, it's called Cooperative Species. A cooperative species is just, it's again, on a whole nother level, just so amazing when you look at how we've evolved as, as humans. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within it that became your superpower? Yeah. Introversion for sure. Uh, number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? I would say it's 
you know, probably that's trying to sound cliche, but I think it's the single best teacher that there is really. Mm. Uh, number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? This one, I wouldn't say it's easy, but for me, <laughs> uh, I don't know if anybody's given you this answer. Rita Levi Montalcini. I don't know if you know her. She's an no, Italian. I think we've heard that one. Yeah. Oh my God. Rita Levi Montalcini is a Italian biologist now deceased that imagine, imagine she's a 30 year old Jewish girl living in Italy in the 19, late thirties, forties under the regime of Mussolini that was basically like expelling all the Jews from, from Italy. So she basically, you know, heads up to Milan, finds some microscopes, literally hides out on a daily basis, uses this bunker in her basement to create some of the best scientific discovery ever in the history of the planet ends up winning the Nobel prize in 1940 something, or it's just, again, I, I think of that. I thought of that a lot when I was ill. I, I think of like how sometimes people are able to perform under, you know, mm. bombings at night, like from the British, it's, it's like in what she was able to do is just, I think, phenomenal. phenomenal. Yeah. When your back's against the wall, sometimes it brings out the best in you. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? My running shoes, my running mm. shoes. Number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. Again, going back to Liverpool football club, I would love to take my kids to the cop which is the stadium that Liverpool plays out of. I, I think that would be just a, an amazing experience for, for all of us. Nice. And final question, number 10, what's one thing you do to win the day? Keep moving. Keep moving. Very important. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Daniel and all the awesome work he's doing with Neurozine. And we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can check out their website, neurozine.com and follow them on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Again, all of that and more will be linked in the show notes. Daniel, so great to see you, my friend. Thanks for coming on the Win The Day Show. James, this was so much fun. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that interview. As you heard, our guests love to hear positive feedback no matter where they're at in their careers. So share a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway so our guests know they made a difference in your life today. If you own your own business and would like to learn how to grow it using your podcast, download a free copy of our Recurring Results Roadmap. You can find that linked in the show notes. And if you're new to the Win The Day Show, hit the subscribe button so you can get access to episodes like this one as soon as they are released. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Finally, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. That's all for this episode. Remember to get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always. 